The Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. And we read in Jesus' name. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the kingdom of God is here even now. We pray, Lord, that as we meditate upon your word this morning, that the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. How often have you heard this text? How often have you heard, uh, I think especially uh, growing up and, and even now as a pastor, we've had a few missionaries come and visit and often this is the, the passage of the Bible out of all the passages that missionaries like to preach on. And I think it's a good, it's a good text and it's a, one that's very appropriate. But generally we, when we think of this, we often think of just that one verse right there Uh, In verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that's that's good. We we should pray for this. But if we just focus on only verse 2, we miss that that God is not only going to send laborers, but he's going to send them out and he's going to be with them. He's going to provide for them in many different ways. And so this morning, as we consider verses 1 through 9, what I notice is we have basically four tools that God gives to his people as they proclaim the gospel, especially here as we look at these 72 being sent out. And I'm going to give you all four of these tools right up front so that way you can remember them. The first one is that he's going to send them out in pairs for protection. He sends them with purposeful prayer, with powerful proclamation, and provision for his people. It's a lot of P's, but I think that helps us to remember these. Pairs, prayer, proclamation, and provision. So let's talk about that first one. The first thing that God gives to his church as they sent out, are sent out are pairs for protection. Last month, or last month, excuse me, last March, I went down to a conference and I met a pastor from Auburn. And he has a unique situation at his church. The church is about our size, a little bit bigger actually, a little bigger. And they have two pastors and they're they're called co-pastors. And the reasoning for it, he said, is because of this passage here. Uh, Because in Luke 10, where it says that he sends them out two by two. He says that having these two workers going together where they're working together, striving together, helps them in a number of ways. And uh, it made me think as we were talking about this, it made me think of, of the pitfalls of, of being on your own. And it reminded me of, of when you uh, watch the Discovery Channel, at least when I was little, I used to watch the Discovery Channel and you'd learn about the animals of the Serengeti of Africa, right? And about wildebeest and lions and, and hyenas. And, and there was always one wildebeest that gets picked off by the pride of lions. It's the one that's on its own. And so what, what, what I see and what we were talking about is how God sends these people out in pairs. And one of the reasons why I think he does so is for protection, for, to protect them from temptation, to protect them from, from their, their own sinful nature. You see, it's, it's not safe to be on your own. You need to be running with the herd. And so God provides these two people as they go out to be able to, to help one another along to be able to converse, to be able to talk about things that are going on in their life. One of the qualities of of this type of conversation is is uh, is that it's candid. 
that you're just open and frank with people about the things that are happening, about your struggles. And so as these pairs go out in 72 total, and I guess in the NASB, the, the, in the KJV, it says 70. There's some split on whether it's 70 or 72. Regardless of the number, what's important for us to see is that they're sent out, and it's an even number because they're sent in pairs. You see, God brings people into our lives to be able to fill this purpose, to fill this purpose of walking with us. And sometimes it's very clear as I look out and I see people paired off with mother and daughter and husband and wife and all of these types of situations. But, but it's not always the case. And so if you are on your own, if you find yourself outside of the herd, I encourage you to, to find someone to be paired up with. And it's not just for, as like an accountability thing. It also has to do with, with our security in Christ. As you think about the gospel and, and the forgiveness of sins. And this morning and every Sunday morning, we confess our sins together and then, and then I turn around and, and I, I tell you your sins are forgiven for, for the sake of Jesus Christ and what he has said in his word. And that this is something that, that is done by someone else for you. God is using me on Sunday and he can use the person you're partnered with to be able to speak this forgiveness of sins to you. But this forgiveness of sins can only be done when you have someone who you talk to. Now, this isn't something that's commanded in Scripture. It doesn't say you must confess your sins, you know, four times a year and it must be in the church and you have to go into that weird booth or whatever. But, but it, we do hear in Scripture over and over the value of confessing our sins to one another. James 5.16 is probably one of the clearest. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. This is something you, you can't do on your own. You can't pray for one another and share your concerns and be open and honest with one another unless you are paired up with someone. Proverbs 28, 13 shares in this as well. It says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. There's nothing more comforting than hearing your sin is forgiven. So you think about that. There's nothing more comforting than hearing this. And, and this is a big theological statement. Everything is theology, but this statement especially so. Because you think of what sin is, that sin is our rebellion against God. Sin is our fighting back against him and what he wants to do in our lives and in the world. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. That's what we do when we sin. And this rebellion, God says, deserves punishment, and that punishment is, is death. It's eternal removal from him and from his grace and from his presence and his love. And, and so when you hear from God's word that you are forgiven, this becomes precious. This becomes the most important thing in the world. Because, yes, God does care about your situation where you are now, and he cares about the struggles in your life, but even more so, his concern and his love for you is shown in that he has sent Jesus to die for your sins, so that way you would be forgiven and could dwell with him for eternity. And not only that, but confessing our sins and hearing the forgiveness of our sins is the greatest tool, it's the greatest weapon we have against temptation. When, when, When David sins against Uriah by sleeping with Bathsheba, and sins against Bathsheba as well, we could say, right? He uses his power and his authority over her. That that what he doesn't do is he doesn't find himself in a place where he can confess his sins. He doesn't find himself in a place where somebody's going to come alongside and say, no, don't do that. Instead, he stays home and he's by himself. And then it's not until after he murders Uriah that Nathan comes and points out his sin and he confesses his sin and Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sins. And at this point is a turning point for David in his life. It changes the whole, the whole reign of his kingdom for the rest of his life and on until Jesus comes. 
Because God says the sword will not depart from your house. And God had given him his pairs. He had given him people who he could rely upon. And when he stays away from them, he falls to sin. So confession and absolution is a great weapon against this because it forces us to be able to be open with our neighbors about our sin and to hear the forgiveness of sins. It also protects us from false doctrine. If you have one person who is, it's their way and and what they say is what is true and is good, then, then that can get twisted for the same reason that we fall into temptations to sin. That if we should never hold up one person in their interpretation above, above the interpretation of, of the Holy Spirit through the church, that, that the church together confesses and believes what rightly comes from the word, one person on their own can be led astray. And we heard in our reading from Titus that this is an important thing for us as a church. It's an important thing for pastors. It's an important thing for you as people who hear the preaching on Sundays, is that we have sound doctrine. And so we don't rely upon my whims and, and my thoughts and, and my, my ideas about what Scripture says. Instead, what we do is we confess together what Scripture says, and we do this by studying God's Word together. And we do this by, by looking at the confession of the church that's paid the test of time that the church together confesses the truth of Scripture, and these confessions are, are like what we said this morning in the Apostles' Creed. It's a summary of what we believe. And anything that is said that is apart from that, we know is to be false. So if you hear someone say, well, Jesus isn't God, or he becomes God, we can say, no, I know this isn't true because the Apostles' Creed tells me so, and Scripture makes it even more clear. And so we need this pair of people being sent out to protect against temptation and against false doctrine, against the teachings that are contrary to Scripture. And we see this also in in Proverbs as well. I'm going to go there again. Proverbs 27, 17 reminds us that iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. You see, God's intention is for us to have people in our lives who we talk about God things with, talk about his word with. The second tool that God gives his church as they are sent out to proclaim the gospel is purposeful prayer. Prayer is nothing other than faith. You don't pray to God if you don't believe in God, but prayer is more than that. It's, it is a work that we do to serve God. It is a loving service to God to pray. It's what we we could call it a sacrifice, right? Much like singing or dropping money in the offering plate is a sacrifice, our prayers are a pleasing sacrifice unto God, a pleasing aroma that ascends even from here or from our car or from our home as we pray to him. And it pleases him when we pray to him. Prayer is a, a conversation of the heart with God, it says in Psalm 27, verse 8. But one of the things I think is also interesting about prayer and what we start to see here as we look at verse two is that prayer is fundamentally also a confession of weakness. Did you ever think of that? When you pray, you are acknowledging that you are weak. You are unable to do that which you're praying for. And they think of it here, especially in this context, where the people are, are, are commanded to pray to the Lord of the harvest because the laborers are few and the harvest is plentiful. And it is a command. It is something that Jesus says, this is what you must do. You must pray for these things. And this, that's why we pray that God would send forth faithful pastors and, and witnesses amongst the world to be able to, to harvest to be able to reap that which has been sown. Only faith in the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake makes prayer, prayer. It's only this faith and this acknowledgement of weakness that we are able to pray. And it's because we pray to God that our prayers become powerful. Our prayers are not some lever for us to move God. But instead, 
what, what we begin to see here, who does, who does Jesus tell to pray? He, he tells the 72 who are being sent. He says, you who are being sent, you must pray. And, and this becomes a, an important point for us because what, what's not happening is it's not, hey, God, send out more people, and if I pray this hard enough, if I believe strong enough that God will do this, no, instead, what it is is it sh- begins to shape the mind and the will of the person who's praying to align their will with God's will and that that they go. You see, when we pray for things, when we pray that we would have, uh, you know, Sunday school teachers, we pray that we'd have pastors and we pray that we'd have messengers or that God's word would shine forth in in our homes, what we're praying is that, God, let me be a part of this. What we're praying is that we're saying, we want to be a part of this solution, God. Use me. Reminds me of the words, here am I, send me, right? And so as we pray to God, what we're doing is we're, we're acknowledging our weakness and we're acknowledging also the willingness that he has placed in us to do his will. Scripture directs us to be purposeful in this prayer and to align our will with God. Now, you might be thinking, I'm not the person to do that job, right? You might be thinking, well, I'm not the person to, to go uh, to a faraway land and learn a new language and, and, and this and that and the other things. And that, sure, that might be so, but if you wait to be equipped to do the work of ministry, you, you'll be sitting and doing nothing. God equips those whom he sends, he tells the people after they have been, been told they're being sent, he tells them, now you must pray. He's saying, you are being sent, but you must pray that you yourself become the worker in the harvest. Whether that be abroad or whether that be right here or at your home or with your neighbor or with your coworker. That's what our prayer ought to be. To pray that we would be the workers of the harvest The third tool that God gives for his church as they are sent out to proclaim the gospel is a powerful proclamation. A powerful proclamation. There's, let's just take a look at this. What does Jesus tell them to do? What does he tell them to say? In verse five, he says, when you enter a house, first say, peace be to this house. Peace be to this house. He doesn't say make an argument or ask them even what their name is. He just says, peace be to this house. Proclaim simply means to announce it forth or to cry out. It means to say something out. And so you think of pro as proceeding, right? It's proceeding from your mouth and what you're proclaiming for is peace be upon this house. What is being proclaimed when we say peace be upon this house or when we're at the back of the church and often I'll say peace be with you, right? Uh, is, or in, and other people respond and also with you or and with thy spirit or whatever it is. What we're proclaiming is, is the word in Hebrew, shalom. The word shalom in Hebrew is, has a very deep and rich meaning and this is the same meaning we need to have when we understand peace. Shalom is peace with God. It's walking with him in the midst of the garden early in the morning, just as Adam and Eve did. Peace, we also see, comes up in Leviticus when God tells Aaron to pray a blessing or say a blessing, proclaim a blessing over the people. When he says, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. And this shalom that is spoken over you at the benediction, this shalom which is proclaimed to you as you enter and as you exit, the shalom that these 72 are commanded to proclaim to the house that they enter is this peace. It's the peace of God which passes our understanding because it is the peace of God that means that we dwell with him forever. That's why it passes understanding is because it's infinite. It goes on and on and on. And this is what the people are to proclaim. And it just simply then says, well, if a son of peace is there, it will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. 
that, that the proclamation of the gospel, telling people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, that the result of this, it doesn't rest on you. That, that when you go and you tell someone that Jesus has died for their sins, whether it's your children or if it's a, a neighbor or if it's someone you've just met, that, that that person and their faith that either comes or does not come has nothing to do with you and your ability to persuade them, your ability to argue with them, your ability to refute their, their arguments even. But instead, it relies 100% upon God. That, that the proclamation of the gospel, we believe that God's word does what it says it does, that, that it falls like the rain, and when it lands on the ground, it waters the earth, and it doesn't return back to heaven void, but instead, the plants grow. And this produces fruit. Bakers can bake bread from the wheat and so on and so forth. And so what we see is that God's word is powerful. And when God's word is working through you, it has a powerful effect on those who hear. That faith is literally created through the hearing of God's word. This is what we see over and over through scripture. If we look at Acts, we see preachers going out, Peter and Paul and preaching to people and it says he preaches in the synagogue he preaches in the in the gathering places of town and that people believed simple as that the holy spirit works powerfully through the preaching of god's word and this has an application for us too as we come here as we consider the things that we ha- we do here at church that what we're doing is we're we're not just coming and hearing a lecture or some, some teaching from Scripture because, because this is what we need to do. We know we need to do it, right? But what we're doing is we're actually coming here to hear that Jesus died for your sins. That's the purpose of us coming. The purpose of us coming is to, to acknowledge that we are sinners and that we need salvation from our sins. And so as we gather, it's not all about flashy lights, not that we have tons of flashy lights, but it's not about flash, it's not even about having the, the most proficient musicians, it's not about having the most up-to-date new songs and things of that nature. No, what it is about, whether we're talking about the liturgy, the things that we do, or the songs that we sing, the prayers that we pray, the confession that we confess, or the sermon that we hear, it's, it's all about the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins because you are a sinner and you do need forgiveness. And so do I. And so God gives us the tool of a powerful proclamation, not just for all those heathens out there, but for all of the sinners who gather together whom he calls his beloved children, who he also calls saints. The fourth tool, the fourth thing that God provides for those whom he sends is simply provision. He tells them to take nothing with them. He tells them that they're not to take along their knapsack. They're not to take along food or anything along that way. That way. No sandals even. And they're not even to greet anyone on the, on the road because what they're going about is an urgent task. It's common, you know, I think of when growing up in the Midwest, you're driving down this barren country road. There's nothing for miles except for maybe a farm here or there. And you meet one F-150 coming down the road and the guy's got a hat on and you see each other coming down the hill and then you, as he goes by, you wave two fingers. Some people, they do one, but most people are two. And what they're doing is they're, they're waving, they're waving to them. And this was a common thing in this day as well, but not only would they stop and maybe wave, but they would they would stop and converse and, and talk about things like the weather, things about, oh, did you hear about what Herod is doing? But he's saying, don't even do that. What I need you to do is go to the place where I am going and proclaim peace upon that house. You don't have time to stop along the side of the road. You don't have time to carry all, all this luggage. Instead, know this. Know that I will provide for you. Know that when you enter a a house, when you enter a town, they're going to set food before you and you can eat whatever is before you because I have pronounced it clean. It is good for you. And so God, he cares for his work. He cares for all of the people who are sent out. And, And I have news for you. If you didn't catch this earlier when we were talking about prayer, that this is you. 
God provides these tools for you because he has called you to proclaim the gospel wherever you are. He calls you to proclaim the gospel in your families, with your neighbors, with your friends. And, and this proclamation of the gospel is simply just, it's simply just saying, Jesus died for your sins. I need that, and you do too. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you do call. You call men and women to serve you in their homes and, and in church and, and within our society, Lord. And we're so grateful for this call. And we're so grateful for those who have heard this call clearly. We do pray again for those nine men. We also pray for their family from the Free Lutheran Seminary as they seek a call in your church, Lord. They desire a good thing. We pray that you'd be with them. But most of all, Lord, we do pray for each one of us here. And for those of us who are normally a part of our gathering but aren't able to be here today, we ask, Lord, that you would, you would constantly remind us that you are with us that you provide for us, that you do the work for us as we proclaim the gospel just as Titus did so many years ago and Paul and and all the faithful saints that have gone before us. And so we pray, Lord, you would encourage us in this, you would strengthen us as we seek to proclaim your name to our city and to our neighborhood and to our friends and family. And we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to remain faithful to you and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.